you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. And, uh, you know, when you listen to the Chris Voss Show, it gives you the Chris Voss Show glow. It's this ambient aura that envelopes you when you listen to the show. And you learn so much. Your brain just, uh, I think I think we can say scientifically your brain increases by at least 0.015%. I don't know what that means. But so that or it's just brain swelling. You should probably have looked at an ER near you. But other than that, you know, if you've fallen, maybe. I don't know. Or if you've fallen, sometimes you feel like you're watching the Chris Voss Show. Anyway, guys, we have the most amazing authors on the show. And refer them, your family, friends, and relatives to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Chris Voss 1 on the TikTokity. And all those crazy places on the internet. We have an amazing uh, author on the show with us today. Her book is called Too Brown to Keep, A Search for Love, Forgiveness, and Healing. Came out September 20th, 2019. Judy Fambro Billingsley is on the show with us today talking to us about her book. She is a uh, part of a quest that she began many years ago to answer many questions of her life. During her journey of discovery, she earned a bachelor's of arts degree, California lifetime teaching credential, and master's degree in educational administration from the University of Laverne, California. She's retired now and a mother of two sons and four grandsons, a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Eta Gamma Sorority. Right, that's, that's like a it's like a tongue twister there. Good alpha job. Alpha. Dude, how many alphas are in there? And a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Saint Sacramento Chapter, the author finds time to serve her church and community in many ways. Welcome to the show, Judy. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you're an alpha, 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 <laughs> alpha. I'm part of, hey, I'm part of the alpha, beta uh, sorority. <laughs> it's, a, it's an old grocery hey, store from the 70s. For men. Yeah. <laughs> It's an old grocery store from the 70s, oh, Alpha okay. Beta. Remember that? Oh, um, yes. You know what? I yeah. do remember that. Yeah, when I was a kid in Cali. A <laughs> I do. Alpha Beta. Uh, whatever happened to that store? Anyway, <laughs> somebody probably bought it. Yeah. But Ralph's is still around, I think. Anyway, give us your dot coms. So tell us where people can find you on the interwebs. You know what? I don't even. On my website is under judyfambrobillingsley.com. Okay. There you go. I do have a Facebook page, which is J and as in Jack, F as in Frank, and B as in Billingsley, and then dot author. But usually, you know, if you type in my name, even if you miss the Fambro and do the Billingsley, I pop up, and you will definitely, you know, find me on Instagram as well. There you go. So, give us a thirty thousand overview of the new book, Two Brown to Keep. I was answering a question that I always had in my life that all of us human beings ask ourselves, whether it's conscious or subconsciously, and that is, who am I? Mm -hmm. And because I was adopted, I wasn't quite sure, especially when my teacher asked me to write when I was in sixth sixth grade, who do you look like? And I'm like, Hmm. I don't look like either one of them, (laughs) my parents, because they adopted me. Who do you look like? Yeah, yeah. Who do you most look like? You know, your mom, your dad, that. And I'll never forget that assignment because I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so that kind of got me on the quest of searching and answering that question, who am I? Mm -hmm. And that memoir here is for that, uh, talking about it. There you go. So did you know that you were adopted up until then? Yes, I did. Uh, One nice thing, my adopted parents did tell me uh, Mm -hmm. day one (laughs) that I was adopted because my sister was adopted with me. I was two. She was eight when they met us in New York at the airport and we were handed over to them and that's how we got to America. And how old were you when you were adopted then? 
I, I was two when I came, officially adopted was later on down the line. I was two years old and actually had to have a nurse with me mm. flying from Germany because, you know, it's a 21 hour trip. Yeah. And my sister, who is she's full blooded sister mm. of mine, we have the mom and same dad. She was five at the time. Now, was there something about your parents that with, were your parents white or black? My father was African-American U.S. Mm -hmm. soldier, Army, mm -hmm. and my mom was a white German woman. Okay, so that's why you, you saw the difference when you were asked in school uh, about that. Now, no, the I, no, oh. no, 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 it had nothing to do with race. It had oh, to okay. Do, yeah, no, not for me. It wasn't about race. It was actually about physically, who do I physically look like? Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. Yeah. That yeah. clarifies that. I was assuming that thing, so it's good we nailed that down. Yeah. Uh, now, the so you don't remember your original parents from the age that you were adopted? No. Okay. There you go. And let's see. So tell us more about uh, growing up with them, you know, what kind of influenced you and and how you got down that road of, of you started looking for this and what was the journey of discovering you know, your past history, why you're put up for adoption, I guess that leads in the title of the book. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, you know, what happened to me is, and I talk about it in, in the book and, and share, but my story is that the frame of mind that everyone, listeners, everyone has to get into is that I was born in 1950. So that is after World War II, which ended in 1945. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, if you think of Germany and Hitler and the Aryan race, they were the pure Aryan race and, mm -hmm. you know, anti-Jewish, anti-black, all of that. They thought they were the pure. Hey, thinking makes sometimes, you know, things happen as we can see yeah. today. But what my birth, my birth father was called back to the United States. Of course, he was gone. Then my birth mother decided that she didn't need to hassle with my sister and I. And so wow. we were put in a kinderheim. And I talk about how that black car came and picked us up and we lift our, left our village never to see anyone ever again. And a kinderheim is a car. Is that correct? I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I don't know. But I'm assuming. I just well, want to lay a foundation. It would be is. nice if it were, Chris. But oh. kinderheim is an orphanage that we Oh, it's an orphanage. Okay. I just want to lay that foundation of what that Thank was, you. so people people That's knew. Because I, I, when you said you were picked up in a Kinder, <laughs> no, <laughs> and driven off, I was like, "Wait, is that a car?" <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you know, all of this that I share in the book, and I do say it in the introduction, is is through my research. Mm -hmm. You know, at two years old, I didn't remember anything other than knowing that I was adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, my adopted parents always assured me that I was loved and I was given up due to my mother loving me. And I always had a big question about that and mm -hmm. discovered that that wasn't exactly the right story. <laughs> but, you know. And uh, so we came to America, actually, when we were dropped off at the Kinderheim in Mannheim, Germany, which I did have an opportunity to go and visit. There were hundreds of us biracial kids. And that's the first time that the United States experienced having children mm -hmm. from their soldiers. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah. We, were, we were actually children who were without a country because being born in Germany, I had German citizenship. Mm -hmm. I had German birth certificate, German name, German birth certificate, all of that. Put in the Kinderheim. We were advertised on newspapers throughout Europe and the United States. And uh, my parents, adopted parents who could not have children, saw that advertisement and adopted my sister and I together, thank goodness. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, now, the title of the book is Too Brown to Keep. Is there something behind that title? Very much. I don't I do want to preface by saying that the book is not all about racial, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what happened to me, I was in Germany and I experienced, I was at a birthday party in Germany in the village, mm -hmm. a small village that I was there till I was two. And I had a very public, hurtful rejection from my older sister who still lives in Germany mm -hmm. uh, and was not adopted with us. And it was embarrassing and hurtful, but I wasn't about to do anything. I took the high road 
and said nothing and walked away. And so in the village, I was spending the night at my babysitter's house. At that time, she had babysat us when we were little. And in the middle of the night, Chris, believe it or not, all of a sudden, I hadn't named my book. I'd been writing it, but hadn't named it. And it said, wow, too brown to keep because there was some racial stuff that she had said to me in German. Okay. Okay. And so I jumped up out of my bed and I wrote it down because you know <laughs> that if I had a stayed sleep and woke up in the morning, I would not have remembered the title. Yeah. So that's And basically it is about when you look at the history and everything that us biracial kids were not accepted. There are six of us that my birth mom gave away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And when I found out I'm the only one, the only one that is brown skinned. My sister who has the same mom and dad, she has blonde hair, green eyes. She's light skinned. Only when I show up, <laughs> do you know? And so I always thought all of my life that because of my brown skin, I had ruined it for everyone else. So I kept that burden for a mm. long time until I discovered that that was not the case. But that it's was still a burden you carried. I know, you know, I mean, I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine a lot of adoptive children go through this. They're like, why yeah. was I rejected? Right. Yes. And it haunts yes. them. And it, it, it creates, I think, sometimes a hole in their life, especially in their future relationships where. Yes. You know, you you do. I, I know that with mother and father abandonment with children, uh, mm -hmm. that happens too, and it creates a hole and it affects their future relationships. Where if they're rejected in love, you know, it opens that wound again. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes we sabotage that. Yeah. That was you know I create it. Yes, to to rather than them leaving us, we create it so they will leave us, and we expect it. There's a lot of psychology in that, and you know, I do want to pref I do want to make sure the audience realizes too, though, that abandonment doesn't necessarily have to be just adoption. You can be abandoned through someone you know, through death. You can be abandoned by even living in a home, but there isn't much love and affection, and so you're abandoned. So we all experience basically the same thing, but abandonment crosses all racial and ethnic lines yeah i sent my kids off to military school until they're 18 as soon as they came out of the womb we just went right in the car and sent them they abandoned you or did you abandon them well we keep moving and faking our death so they're teenagers now so we're trying yes. to <laughs> mari mari keeps calling me to come on a show and i'm not doing it so no way. You don't want her to tell the truth, right? I don't want a DNA <laughs> test to connect me to whatever that was. I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was I was raised, Chris, that you don't air your dirty laundry. You know? I do. This is how we work on this show. This is how we do the this family dirty show. laundry. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, they're good kids, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. it was that or send them to the Chinese organ harvesters <laughs> and get me a new BMW for those little kidneys. Don't do that, folks. That's bad. No, I'm going to get hate mail. How does the journey work when you go back and try and research this stuff? It can be very hard for a lot of adoptees to get data on on who their parents were, why they were put up for adoption. You know, what's it was like trying to go back through all this? You know, I love research. I what I focused in on for my career was being a teacher and I was a social studies history teacher. So I preference my answer with that, that I love research. And so one of the things, the motivating factor, of course, is discovering who truly am I. And I had a double edged sword because I don't speak German. So therefore I lost that language coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was blessed that my adopted father had kept a shoebox full of the adoption papers, both in German and translated in English. And so he handed that to me when I turned 25 and said, I think you're old enough now. And mm -hmm. who I focused in on first was my birth father, because one, he spoke English Two, the military keeps excellent records. Oh, wow. <laughs> excellent records. If you're looking for ancestry, boy, military records are great. And so I, through the adoption papers, actually had his last known address. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say maybe for some of your listeners who are younger, back in my day, there wasn't the internet in the beginning. And yeah. therefore we dialed 411, 
which was information operator. Wow, I forgot about that. <laughs> yes. And so I went through Pemberton, New Jersey. I went through the 411 asking the operator to give me the phone numbers, and they'd only give three at a time. And that's how I found him through the phone. Through the phone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, With the 411, as they used to the call 411. it. 411. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I don't use that anymore. I used to use that and say, hey, Give me the 411, but people look at me like, what is that? <laughs> Hip to be square. <laughs> it's supposed to mean give me the information, but you know, nowadays yeah. nobody knows that. <laughs> I think nowadays they have their own stupid lingo that they made up. And... <laughs> you know what it's called? Google. <laughs> Google that. My grandson, you know. Oh, that's right. It is it. called Google. Uh -huh. that. Yeah. yeah, he'll ask a question, and my son, you know, he'll look at his son, my grandson, and say, Google it, Deb. <laughs> yeah, I do that to my mom all the time. She'll ask me just about any banal question, that, <laughs> and I'll, I'll just be like, you know, you can Google this stuff. Um, mm. <laughs> if you, you know, because she wants it right away. You know, yeah. she's, yeah. she's, I need this information now, and I'm like, you know, and I'm, I'm usually, you know, busy with 50,000 things. It's, you know, you can't Google it, Mom. I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> I don't mind helping you, but, you know, if you want the information faster, mm -hmm. it's available there. How long did it take you to research all of, of your your past and your adoptive parent or your your pre your your parents, your biological parents? Mm -hmm. how, how long did that take to? You know, this was it's a great question. This was really this was really a lifetime experience for me because I would do bits and pieces I discovered my birth father. I do have to say I was blessed when I called him that he did not deny that wow. I was his daughter because you can get rejected. Of yeah, course. That yeah, but you know, life takes over, Chris. I got married. I had two sons. I was going to college. I was teaching, you know, you buy a house, you know, all of that. So I was setting those things aside. It was not a top priority because I needed to raise my kids. And then as they grew left home actually i did not really start back until they were teenagers and my birth dad got in contact in the village because he still spoke german mm -hmm. he'd been in germany for 15 years or so that i then had my lady who babysat me and she spoke nothing but german but they contacted me mm -hmm. so i began that and took my kids actually over to Germany for a while. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And wandered around. And now you said your sister still lives there. Do you have you, do you have an amicable relationship with your sister? The one that said ugly things to you when you were a child? <laughs> oh, she said ugly things to me when I returned. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's yeah. That was one of the rejection pieces. She hated me being there. Is so, it, was no, it over? I, it was it over a reflection of race? You know, I believe, I believe that, yes, because when I went back a couple of times, I've been back to Germany every other year till COVID, she did say that I was the reason that, because she was given up also. My birth mother left her with the babysitter in the village after we had gone to the Kinderheim, wow. and my birth mother left her with our babysitter in the village and went to work and never returned. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that life's challenges, that's one of the messages in the book is that you, we have resilience mm -hmm. and, you know, we, for me, it's not about anything other than me having the joy in my own life. And I'm not going to allow anyone who has hurt me to take away my joy. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to look and research, see who I was, see who I look like. I look like my mother, but I have my dad's skin. Tell her. Were you able to find your mom? Then? Yes, I did. And did you she, talk to her? I did. Uh, mm -hmm. She didn't talk to us, though. <laughs> oh. And in the book, I talk about our, our first and only, first and last and only meeting with her. That's unfortunate. Yes, but, you know, I was prepared for that because I had mm -hmm. done my homework in regards to some mothers who do reject. Yeah. 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 It's unfortunate. You know, and you would think with a story with your sister, you would think that, you know, adopted siblings would bind together, you know, kind of a life raft and, and, and support each other. So that's interesting as well. 
So now, now what are you up to? You've written the book. You're sharing your story mm -hmm. with people. Uh, how are you using this to empower others and influence others? One of the things that I was really on a roll before COVID, I was actually doing personal book appearances and speaking, which I dearly like. Uh, and then I switched during COVID to Zoom. I'm pretty good with Zoom. <laughs> and so I have had books, you know, talks through Zoom. And I'm kind of getting back now into podcasts, which I'm learning about. And mm -hmm. thank you, Chris, for allowing me here. Mm -hmm. I was on Spotlight TV Network with Logan Crawford. And I'm also would like to branch more into personal speaking. I, I love speaking. And I love engaging the audience as well. Mm -hmm. There you go. Do you do any coaching or consulting to adoptive parents, things like that? I have, ha asked, have had parents who have adopted or fostering biracial children have mm -hmm. uh, called me and talked to me. And I coach them. I don't push myself on them if, if, if they call. I do have a group <clears throat> that has asked me to come and talk to them and answer questions. So I do do that, and I'm certainly available for that. You know, we were talking before the show about how I recently, I'm not sure if it was a viral trend. Sometimes you're on TikTok, and you'll see these things, and you're like, that's kind of odd. Uh -huh. And then you realize it's like a viral trend. It's something going crazy. And I think it might have been a small one, a wave or something. I don't know. But there was... There was a bunch of videos I saw. This was about two or three days ago. Mm -hmm. I spend too much time on TikTok, clearly. <laughs> Who doesn't? And it's so addictive. <laughs> so addictive. But but they were there was this back and forth, you know, of I guess a, a, a white couple who had adopted a black child. Mm -hmm. And I guess there was a lot of black people who were not too happy. Like, why are white people doing this? And there were, there were other, I think, black people defending the couple going, you know, I mean, hey, who cares? It's love. If you, if you love a child, a child's a child, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you just want what's best for them. And I know a lot of people that they can't have children. They want children. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's done in service where they just, they're just like, I want, I'd like to have another kid without that whole, you know, having yes. breeding and, and, you know, nine month thing. <laughs> I really can't blame women for that. That nine months <laughs> never sounds like a lot of fun from all I've seen. But uh, I'd skip that process if I was a man. I'd just be like, we're just going to skip to the good part, I good guess. Good part, yeah, the fun Which, part. I'm not sure the diaper part's the fun part, but that's something. I'm, I have no idea. But, you know, I don't know. Do you, you know, that's probably something you could maybe help people with, understanding, you know, the value in, you know, being adopted regardless of race and things like that. I, I think there's... I don't know if you have any thoughts on what people are doing over there in TikTok, maybe. <laughs> I don't know anything about TikTok other than, you know, sometimes it comes up. But I, I definitely certainly want to address that because it's not about what I talk to foster or adopted parents who have biracial children is only that what we need to learn, which a lot of people haven't heard that term, a code switching. Hmm. And what that means is, and I'm an example of it, so I'll use myself, <laughs> mm -hmm. is coming to America way back when <laughs> I got, I came to America in 1953, so you can see how old I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Biracial children were not, we were extremely unique. In fact, the yes. TV stations wanted us on television. We were unique. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays that's not the case. But mm -hmm. I was grateful that I had parents and they were both African-American who adopted my sister and I, but they did not ignore the white side of me. Mm. And so what my dad, who was a very successful businessman did during a time I grew up in a community where the KKK was a little pre prevalent. Okay. Mm. And but my dad, because he's a successful businessman, we would go to all white functions Mm -hmm. And they taught us the etiquette and norms of oh, wow. what we were to do. And then I went to an all black church. My mom was president of the NAACP for a while. And so I learned the etiquette and the norms of African-American culture. And that's what code switching is. And we all do it regardless of race is knowing the environment we're in and what's acceptable and what's not. And mm -hmm. I think with foster parents and adoptive parents who have biracial kids, what they don't want to do is just 
have them in their own culture. They need to make sure that they expose them to the other culture that they have as well. Oh, wow. There and you that's go. a learning experience because most white people, to be honest with you, and Chris and push back if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Most white people have never been to a function where they're the only white person there. Yeah. But we, as I know I have, I've been to many functions where I was the only African-American dark skinned person there. I fit in. I didn't have a problem with it. I didn't even think about it, mm. but that's what we have to do is, is expose our kids. There you go. Get everybody, you know, in, in the program. You know, it's 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 an interesting thing. I mean, uh -huh. I always wanted to be adopted. In fact, I'll adopt recently, Chris. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I've always joked that I don't look like my parents, and <laughs> and in fact, we recently took another DNA test to prove it. Oh, stop. Uh, my mom, <laughs> no, she actually really wanted to do an ancestry dot com, and and I was joking. Oh. Uh, evidently, I took back when Twenty Three and Me came out about yes. ten years ago. Mm -hmm. They sent me a complimentary influencer copy, uh -huh. and so I I took a DNA test, and she was mm -hmm. very bent out of shape at the results of it, but because some of the countries that I was showing I was coming from uh -huh. different than hers. <laughs> and so the running joke for 10 years has been like, I definitely was adopted. <laughs> and my That's family cute. had a bit of dysfunction to them. Uh -huh. they, they're, they're good people trying to do their best, but mm -hmm. they're really fucked up. Uh, wait, did I say that out loud? <laughs> you know, they're families. <laughs> there you go. And so the joke has always been that I've been adopted. And, mm -hmm. and she's like, oh, we, you know, we didn't adopt you. And I'm like, no, I got switched to birth. I was one of those 70s. <laughs> I was one of those 60s kids where, you know, some yeah. some nurse was yes. evil and switching babies. Uh, that's what she was smoking and she dropped her cigarettes. And Handed the wrong one. She was smoking there in the room there in the hospital. Yes, yes. Switched the name tags story. wrong. And I'm like, yeah, that's what happened to me, I'm pretty sure. Because yeah. yeah. I seem yeah. to be smarter than everyone else in this yeah. room. And uh, but uh, yeah, she we finally took an ancestry. Mm -hmm. and Unfortunately, I'm not adopted. No, I, I did the 23 and me. Yeah. And I had done it before I actually had even gone to Germany. I was just having doing my research, but I did the 23andMe and, you know, my grandmother, who is my mom's, my birth mother's mother, she was Ashkenazi Jew. Mm -hmm. And so during World War II, the Nazi Germans came and got her and put her in a concentration camp and mm -hmm. she died there. But 23andMe, when I did mine, I was a quarter Ashkenazi Jew, a mm. Jewish, which was, and I, I felt really proud of all the sections of, you know, uh, my DNA that, uh, that came through 51% European, you know, had some little bit of African in me and all of that. And I'm like, I'm just a, a walking world representative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we did, we did, yeah, we did the full test on the rest of our family and we, we can't figure out why some of our family, evidently their DNA test came back that they're really stupid. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Just being funny. Yes. Okay. Uh, we didn't have to, we didn't have to do a DNA test to find that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See how I set that up. But there you go. But I do want to say, Chris, that for people who are searching for their ancestry, 23andMe DNA, looking into it is helpful. I know that my birth dad, his kids did his, submitted his 23andMe DNA. They didn't know any, you know, anything about me, but having done it, it did verify too that, Hey, I am his daughter, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do some research if, if people are interested in their heritage. Through yeah. that. Was there any chance, I imagine with those things, you can maybe find grandparents. Any chance you were able to find the grandparents and stuff? I didn't find grandparents, but I do have with 23andMe, you know how they give you alerts and mm -hmm. there are, so there's distant cousins and that wow. kind of thing throughout Europe. Yes, I did. And also through Pemberton, New Jersey back in on my birth dad's side as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't communicate with them, but it was kind of interesting to see. Yeah, I have started getting pop-ups from that ancestry and I'm like, I really don't want to know about more of my family. I know <laughs> I know too much. So. I was I was going to say that you know uh, what what's interesting too for me is you know when I, I wrote 
when I was writing the book, because I didn't set out to write a book, actually. It's mm -hmm. only when telling friends about, oh, I discovered this, or do you know, I have another sibling I discovered. You know, they're like, you need to write a book. But how what I'm saying about the book is I only, it's only 142 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I feel like our attention span, is, yeah. you know, is not that long. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just focused in on my experience through that part of life. You know? There you go. Well, I know, I know I had a business partner who's, who's a girlfriend and I think later fiance was adopted mm -hmm. and she was trying really hard to find it, but the, it was the USA records and, you know, mm -hmm. you know there's some sort of policy of, of being closed off or, not, yes. you know, you can't, you can't find your person because they don't want you to find them yeah. uh, kind of like with my situation with my kids in the military school and <laughs> you don't want them finding you huh? <laughs> no no i faked my death at least twice to make sure that we've covered our tracks so I yeah my name my name's really bob smith <laughs> and or wait maybe that's the way i'm changing it next week <laughs> that's probably a lot of bob smiths around yeah. you, you don't want teenagers to find you <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because when I was in the village, I was grateful when I first went to the village and it is a village truly. OK, I'm not talking mm -hmm. about a little town. It was a true small village and uh, the older people. I was grateful for the older people who came running out, Uta Uta, because that's my German mm -hmm. name, you know, coming to hug me and everything. So that was a time that I was grateful that they lived long enough, you know, to yeah. validate that I had lived there, you know, and that there they knew. Yes. Wow. So they remembered you from when you were two then? Yes. Yes. Wow. Actually. Yeah. From, from when I was born and brought to the village, because my birth mother lived in the village when I was born, wow. I was born in the hospital in Frankfurt, Germany, but brought to the village. Yes, they did. And, you know, it was kind of interesting. Our lifestyle is so different in America because in in the village, they would see me walking, just walking, you know, around and they say, Uta, Uta. And so I would come up and have tea and go in any anybody's house. I didn't know who they were, you know, in, a, in the United States, you'd probably get killed. <laughs> I do that now. I just walk <laughs> you in. You do that now. <laughs> like, my name's Uta. You um, are a brave. Do you, remember me, do you remember me from a child? I don't do it in Texas, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my sister <laughs> lives in Texas. Yeah. But, you know, Texas, you're probably going to get shot. You do, you know, yes, yes. Walk into someone's house. It's probably the place where you get shot. Yes, you know. yes. Up, well, here, I, up here in Utah, it, everyone leaves the doors open anyway. At least they used to up until about 10 years ago. But, you know, California, they're, they're not going to shoot you. <laughs> they're probably going to offer you like a zucchini <laughs> shake or something like that. <laughs> and you know what you're sharing right now is a part <laughs> of code switching, Chris. Oh, is that you what, know what I mean? Okay. You are telling right. me how you know the difference of the culture in Texas versus yeah. the difference in the culture in utah yeah yeah and so that's code switching you know what yeah. behavior is accepted if you walk into someone's house in california they're just gonna say are you here for the yoga <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. yeah or the marijuana one or, or the, the marijuana yeah <laughs> that's, that's california for you hey yeah were you, coming, were you going to the beach with us what's going on <laughs> so this has been very insightful give us your final pitch out on people to order the book and uh, get in touch with you on your website I am, again, the book is Too Brown to Keep, A Search for Love, Forgiveness, and Healing. And if you Google my name, Judy Fambro Billingsley or Judy Billingsley, you will find me on my site. Also, my book is available, not only soft copy, but also audio um, on Amazon.com. Yeah. There you go. Amazon.com. Amazon. I self-published my book, which is nowadays is getting common for people it is very common actually yeah the ai is making it even commoner like people are like really going out of control with the ai so yeah, yeah. they are i didn't have ai i was busy hiring pub hiring people to edit my book <laughs> yeah. yeah they've got these people that are just bombing the ai thing it's going out of style it's it's pretty insane mm -hmm. so, yeah they're just yeah. making books like they're hijacking books with ai I saw Kara Swisher's book when it came out recently mm -hmm. and she had a bio coming out that I think she self wrote. And so they hijacked all of her, her they hijacked her book with fake AI bios. And, wow. and, you know, so you couldn't, you know, they flooded the zone. So people were like, which one's her book? 
and it was crazy. Are you serious? Are you serious? I'm serious. It's a heart attack. I just had wow. I just had Frank Faguzzi on the show with his uh-huh. book, Long Road, I think it's called. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and he said that they, they had to start getting with... Uh, he's kind of targeted because he's an ex-FBI agent. Direct, he's an ex-assistant uh-huh. director to the FBI. Uh-huh. And so they, he gets kind of targeted by groups. And he's very vocal online. And so they, you know, China, he's not, he's not, let's just say he's not traveling to China or Russia anytime soon. And, uh, you know, the assistant director of the FBI, you don't make a lot of friends, evidently. <laughs> at least, at least not with the bad people. He was talking about how his book got hijacked and, and it, some people have copied it and resold it. And I guess they're selling it without, they're selling, they're selling it with the cover, but nothing inside of it. It's basically a scam book. And they had to get with Amazon. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on. But yeah, self-publishing has really become a thing. Yeah, yeah, it has. It has. Yeah. Do we get your dot coms as we go out? Any socials you want people to look you up on? No, they can just Google me and Facebook. You could do mm-hmm. Facebook, which is jfb.author. But with the Google, you'll click Instagram. You'll click those sites. I'm sorry. I, I have them sitting here, but... Should I say them out loud? Yeah, you can. Sure. Oh, okay. That's why we well, you're, your... you're certainly welcome to email me at mm-hmm. Judy by 10, J U D Y B I 10, the number 10 at gmail.com. There you go. And my website is Judy Fambro Billingsley.com. Mm-hmm. And Instagram is Fambro Billingsley. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and I'm on Facebook, of course. There you um, go. The old yeah. Facebook there, the yes. Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, uh, I, I yeah. think that's kind of old school. I know um, I'm, even though I'm retired, I still work at schools. I coach a new administrators, principals mm-hmm. and vice principals, and I'm there. And the young people, they're like, Facebook? No. <laughs> <laughs> they're into Twitter and what's that, X? Oh, yeah, that's the old Twitter now. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and TikTok. And so it's kind of interesting. So I know my audience, okay? It's not there you teenagers. Go. There you go. You got to know your audience. That's definitely, that's definitely a thing. Yes. So yes. it's been wonderful to have you on. Thank you very much for coming to the show. We really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Thank yeah. you. There you go. So to our audience, order the book wherever fine books are sold. Two Brown to Keep, A Search for Love, Forgiveness, and Healing by Judy Fambro Billingsley. You can find it wherever fine books are sold. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time.